Hello everyone and welcome to the True Potential Do More With Your Money podcast. Uh, very interesting title this week, all about inheritance tax, what you need to know about property, money and shares. So something that is um, you know, in the news at this minute in time in terms of slight changes within the budget. Um, what we would like to do today is just dissect that a little bit and, and go through uh, the rules and potential changes uh, that may be happening uh, following that budget. To help me do so, uh, I'm joined by some pretty qualified people, all financial advisors, or were financial advisors, <laughs> uh, but still have the qualifications. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Lewis, Hannah, and John today. Welcome, everybody. Hi, These have all been on the podcast before. Don't need to introduce you, I think. Have I been on the po- I think yeah. I have with all of you. So mm-hmm. no, that's that's excellent. So let's jump uh, straight into it. Uh, Lewis, can I come across to you, please? Um just give me a little bit on inheritance tax, what it is, you know, what people need to look for and, and whether they should you know, be concerned or, or look at this as an issue for themselves. Yeah, well, basically, it's when an individual passes away and, and moves their wealth, their estate down to another individual. Um, and at that point, you have certain thresholds or allowances, um, which you have to be above that value for any inheritance tax to be due, which is currently at 40% if you are above those thresholds. Um, it can be reduced to 36% if you leave more than 10% to, to charity. Um, so yeah, that's essentially sort of how inheritance tax might come into play. Great, and if I'm a client, um, you know, is there, I'd probably skip across to yourself, John, and here, but if I'm a client, What's the areas that I, should I be thinking about? Is this just you know just my assets that I hold in terms of investments, or is it property? Is it other things? Is it is it everything now? What's the what's the generic of? Yeah, I mean it, it's most things now, especially following the budget. So you think of the typical examples: your house, any bank accounts, cash savings, ISAs, general investment accounts, any kind of asset that you own as an individual could be assessed for inheritance tax, and. We'll come on to it in a moment, I'm sure, but with the, the recent changes in the budget, it's expected that pensions will start to form part of that as well from 2027, uh, which which hasn't been the case until until now. Um, yeah, I think we'll put that caveat in right now because we are going to discuss about this and I think it's it's important that we do discuss it, but it, it still is under consultation. Um, True Potential as a business will reply to that consultation and give our view on that as well. Um, but it's, it's quite important that the rules aren't set in stone. Um, and I suppose, Hannah, if clients are asking about this now, what would your sort of advice be? Just kind of wait um, until we know a bit more about it? Yeah, so I think it's never too early to start reviewing um, mm-hmm. and making sure that, you know, we're, we're dealing with what we know um, and reviewing the retirement plan and making sure that, you know, you're going to be doing things as tax efficiently as possible. So, yes, although we're waiting to see how it's going to be implemented and how things are going to work, um, it's not too soon to start discussing with your advisor and, and making sure that you're getting the appropriate advice. Yeah, definitely. I think we've all, it's, it's a conversation we have regular with individuals. I think in every report that we write, we have to assess whether there is a potential liability of inheritance tax and and how you can help clients with that, isn't that right, John? Yeah, I think when we think about inheritance tax and we think about retirement, you know, yes, pensions have been great in terms of I can pass it on without thinking about inheritance tax, but I think for for your average person, the pension first and foremost is there to actually, you know, take money from and and live on in retirement. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's nice that if you happen to pass away with with anything left in your pension, Mm -hmm. it's been free of inheritance tax until now, Um, that looks like it's potentially going to change. It just changes the nature of those conversations in terms of, well, what order might I use my assets in during retirement to, to leave them in the best possible position when I do pass away? Yeah, and I think what one area that was picked up on the, the budget was the IHT tax-free threshold will remain frozen until 2030. Hannah, just, just talk me around the thresholds in terms of how, if I'm an individual looking at my assets, how I would know that this applies to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so everyone has a, a nil rate band of 325,000. Um, and if you own a property and you have a direct descendant, you can get an extra 175,000 called the residential nil rate band. Um, and that's your, your, your thresholds. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, on the property side, which we're going to talk about as part of the, the session later on. But um, one of your biggest assets is what you live in. Mm-hmm. And um, for for many people, that can get you above the threshold without even realising. So it's always worth making sure you're considering the actual property that, you, that you're living in. Yeah, and just one other thing that, that I would add to that is when it comes to your main, res- main residence nil rate band, it is something that you also can lose. So um, if your estate is over £2 million, 
that for every two pound that you're over, you lose one pound of your main residence till rate band. So if you only had one, it'd be 2.35, where it would be fully lost. If you had two, then it'd be 2.7 million before you, you'd fully lose that. Yeah, what I would recommend on the government website, there is some good examples. Um, so if, you, if you're kind of just wondering, or, or actually, if you just want some help, understand this, we're here for you as an advisor, but it's worth looking at the website. Yeah, absolutely. And Lewis mentioned, you know, whether you've got one allowance or two allowances, it's, it's worth driving home the point that married couples can... Um, kind of share their allowances when you pass your assets to your spouse you don't think about inheritance tax it's mm. it's exempt but when they come and pass away mm. if you haven't used your allowance your, your 325 or your 175 they can claim it for themselves as well so effectively 650,000 pounds worth of assets and another 350,000 on the property side for a, a million in total between a couple let's talk about those changes now then so Lewis, just talk me a little bit of who, what the government are looking to, to do when it comes to inheritance tax or pensions yeah, well, basically, from um, from the 6th of April 2027, um, your unused pensions and most of your pension death benefits will, will then form part of your estate, um, which, you know, like we've just mentioned there, you know, is, is a massive change from what, what it is. Um, so we have got two years, basically, before that, that com- comes into play, um, you know, which, absolutely right, we just start playing now. It does make it difficult for us because, you know, when... You know, we would normally look at things before, like John mentioned, where you might leave that pension because of his extra inheritance tax, you know, benefits. Um, now it might be something where you take a lot earlier, but we're in this little bit of grey period. So, yeah, so it's, it is interesting over that. What we are, what they are looking at introducing is it will be things like the pension scheme that does pay that inheritance tax if mm-hmm. there is any due. A lot of that consultation is around sort of the technical details of that at the moment. But yeah, it does look you know like that's coming in um, unless a consultation really throws up anything you know really differently. Mm-hmm. Um, but then yeah, there's there's lots of other things that you know we need to take into account, um, particularly. Um, Things like income tax as well, once you inherit that pension, um, you know, there'd be a lot of different things to, yeah, this to is think something, about. Let's, let's just unpick this a little bit, because that's something I, um, when I first seen seen this, was kind of working out how it works. So <laughs> current rules around pensions, um, talk me through that. So I think the if you, if you die before 75, that's tax-free. Mm-hmm. Um, after 75, it's taxed at the beneficiary's marginal rate. So they're the, the two areas. So what we're seeing on this, is those won't change. Actually, it's just an additional tax that could potentially come in from inheritance tax. So that's the, so potentially there's, you've, you've got that double taxation after 75. Is that correct, Emma? Uh, well, with it, when the, uh, if the beneficiaries inherit the, the pension, mm. it's only tax, income tax when they withdraw. If they keep it in a pension, yep. that can defer it a yes. little bit further as well. So, but yeah. Well, that's a really important part because we have conversations with clients currently where actually benefiting from keeping it into pensions actually quite a benefit to those clients. So mm-hmm. it's something to consider. So would you say um, when we do get to this point, it's actually worth getting advice whether that's appropriate to, for you at that point? Mm-hmm. I yeah. think it, it definitely changes the some of the decisions that you might want to make. You know, pensions, you can pass them on indefinitely. You know, I could pass it to my partner. I could pass it to my children, they could pass it to their children when they've got their own mm. children. But now that we've got this sort of inheritance tax to think about when it comes to pensions, you know, if I'm passing a pension on, I'm paying 40% on some or all of it. Um, if they want to then leave it on to someone else, you don't want to have to pay the 40% again. Mm. So it starts to change the nature of those conversations about mm. how we want to use the funds. And it's, I think it's interesting that they've They've announced the change and then they've come out to consult on it to decide how they're actually going to mm-hmm. go about doing it because with pensions, they're, they're traditionally held in a, a sort of trust environment. Mm-hmm. And essentially what they're, they're saying is they're going to you know, be able to access that trust and charge inheritance tax on it, which isn't something that they've been able to do before now. So it's interesting to see what comes of the consultation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm intrigued how it's going to work in practice in terms of um, how we communicate and pay that tax. Um, it'd be quite interesting because one of the, I think one of the benefits I've noticed from pensions, um, you know, bit working with clients for many years now, a true potential is the speed of which you can get them to the beneficiary when needed. Mm-hmm. Um, because effectively beneficiary sits out the state, it's at the, it's at the trustee's discretion. Um, and you find that pensions can move pretty much, you know, as soon as the trustees approve it rather than wait for probate, et cetera. So that's the big benefit of that. 
that may change with this type of you know for everybody, not just for uh, people that have these um, have you know these thresholds. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, even for an individual whose estate maybe isn't going to be over the inheritance tax threshold. Um, when someone passes away, if you have to wait for probate and you have to wait for the tax office to decide whether or not mm -hmm. your pension is liable to inheritance tax, it's adding that that sort of little bit of a delay. So obviously, um, when it comes to your your pension and inheriting that that pension, if you're receiving an income and that income's coming into the household, um, John, I'm presuming that'll actually stop until this is resolved. Yeah, certainly. If pensions have to go through probate and we have to wait for inheritance tax calculations, if if I'm receiving an income and I pass away, um, yes, that income's going to have to stop until the the probate's resolved. Um, like you say, if if it's a household that's relying on that income, it it could create issues. Um, because they've got that natural delay between the pension being passed to the beneficiary and restarting the income again. And if that, it's interesting. That's a really you know good point because if if it is delayed by anything on this basis, then that could really affect customers. I think what I would like to see is we mentioned that um, you know it won't affect when you pass your pension to your spouse. I would like to see if a spouse is to inherit a pension. It maybe don't need to go through the whole of the probate process. That'll be a, yeah. a sensible thing to come out of the consultation, hopefully, yeah. mm -hmm. um, because it will be spouses that are the most reliant on each other's income. Yeah. And it would be good for that to continue, um, even if probate's needed. Yeah, that, I agree. I think that would be a real sensible approach. We want to get, in, you know, as an individual, you want to ensure that your assets go to your loved ones as quickly as possible, which is why I, I plug this now, why we always recommend people to get a will mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't have any delays and you can move fast on these things when needed. Um, you just would hate this to, to delay things further because there's sort of interdepartmental um, sort of information that you need from HMRC. So it'd be interesting how they do that. And I, I, I'm sure that we'll be thinking in the client's best interest of how we can do that at speed. What is interesting, though, when you look at the actual numbers, um, you know, the government estimates that it'll, it'll about ten, you know, ten thousand five hundred estates paying inheritance tax, um, looking at about about one point four six billion, a, um, in terms of uh, tax each year. Um, in the scheme of things, that's quite small numbers. Um, uh, one point four six billion is a lot of money. I'm aware of that, but ten, you know, ten and a half thousand individuals for the people that it will affect. That's something that w will hurt. But it feels like it is still relatively small numbers on that basis. Yeah, I mean, what I find interesting is obviously a lot of the tax increases were geared around this sort of black hole that was, yeah. was apparently there. But this is not something that's coming in straight away. This mm -hmm. is this is two years down the line. So I think what we'd hope is that we're having growth and that's what's bringing the revenue down the line. So it, it, it does seem like an interesting. I think what it comes down to is that they feel that people are using pensions for the wrong thing, like you alluded to, John, is that they're there for your retirement income and that's, you know, mm. where a lot of individuals weren't using them that way. Um, you know, they were following the rules that were in place for 10 years and, you know, they, they shouldn't really sort of be chopping and changing. I think, you know, that it's difficult to be planning that way. Yeah, and I think uh, we've likely give advice to help clients in this way to say, you know, when they're looking at the best way of taking their income, if they've got an inheritance tax, we would recommend potentially that to, to leave money in their pension. So I think it's, Works both ways. It's difficult now. The rules change, and we have to think about that in a slightly different way. Um, but what I would say, this is obviously when the consultation things may change and unlikely, but they may change based on feedback. I think it's more the consultation feels more around the mechanics of how it would work mm -hmm. um, and and how the industry works with HMRC to ensure it's you know in the best interest of customers. I think that's more what what we're seeing. But you you never know. So I think it's worth just waiting until we we understand that a bit more. Um, and if you do have any questions and you you know you feel like you're in this position where it could affect you, then speak to your advisor. That would be yeah. always the thing I would I would say. One one thing I would probably cut out into it is that it won't affect between spouses and civil partners. Mm -hmm. So they will still, you know, if you you're married or you have a civil partner, you will still get that and that won't form part of the state and be subject mm -hmm. to inheritance tax. So for them it's it's more something that's gonna impact probably your children yeah, or the loved death. ones. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a key consideration is if, if you cohabit, so you're not married, you maybe do have to do some additional planning. You know, I guess you could say get married. I don't, I don't <laughs> say. <laughs> um, you know, I probably wouldn't go that far with clients, but I, I, I spoke to an individual you know, in, in the last couple of weeks and um, they're in a position where all their assets are in, in their name and they, they cohabit. And it's a you know dangerous position when when they're gonna she's gonna be reliant on on that retirement income. Mm. So some planning really has to be done in those areas. Yeah, 
did you tell them I get married? I did mention it, <laughs> but he <laughs> didn't seem hugely enthusiastic about it. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, less, it's less. interesting you say that because you, you mentioned I've um, worked as a financial advisor in the recent past and I've had similar conversations with clients and the next time I spoke to them after discussing it, they were like, oh, well, yeah, I've just proposed, we'll, we'll set a date for next year. And I was like, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are you like create the, another married couple. Are you the Cupid of financial services, John? Is that that's, what you say? That's what I go by these days. Yeah. <laughs> Great, brilliant. What's right, it? folks, let's let's talk around um, tax implications on inheriting property. Um, I mentioned earlier before, you know, one of the big things that you you kind of don't sort of realise sometimes is when you're looking at your assets, you forget about the thing that you're actually living in, which is typically your biggest asset. Mm-hmm. Um, there is obviously rules around that we discussed before, but let's just go through the sort of the thresholds and the rates again, just on on that if, in terms of property. If you do have a, you sort of probably Lewis, do you want to go through it? Um, in t- just from an inheritance tax point of view. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So we, we. So basically, you, your main residence nil rate band, mm-hmm. you get a one hundred and seventy five thousand, but it could only be used if your main residence goes down as direct ascendant, it's not mm. second properties or, you know, things like that. So, yeah, it has to go down to, to kids or grandchildren. Mm. Um, and you each get one. Um, so if property moves between spouses, if, you know, the first one that passes away, they mm. can inherit the, the you know, the late partner's um, main residence. Or so basically between you get that 350000 cover um, for, you, for your main residence. Um, if you have other properties... Mm. Then your nil rate band, which is three hundred and twenty five thousand, can can cover them. And if we expand that out a little bit to um if you've got two or three properties, so your rental properties, how does that how is that included in your estate, Hannah? Um yeah, it, it does form part of the estate. Mm. Um and yeah, liable to if it's an asset in your name, just like the, the main residence, then it will it will be counted towards inheritance tax. Yeah. yeah. Especially that I mean that the, the year where someone sort of passes away. Yeah. That that rental you'll have still have to do a self assessment for it. That rental mm-hmm. income is still part of that. You know during that that year. Yeah. Um, one one thing that you do lose though is is your things like your personal allowance post death. So there is yeah. allowances you lose. And it's one of those things with property because this was a a, a much talked subject prior to the budget around CGT, so capital gains tax, and how would that change? Um, let's talk about how that has changed because it has, and might as well bring that in there and and how that could affect people on the sale of a second property. Um, John? Yeah, so in terms of capital gains tax itself, the rates at the, the basic and the higher level were increased. So basic rate of capital gains tax is now 18%, and uh, the higher rate is 24%. Now, that's when you sell an asset, so it could be shares, it could be anything, and it actually brings capital gains tax for everything in line with the rates that already existed for things like property. So uniform bans across the board for capital gains tax. Now, when it comes to inheritance and passing away, you don't tend to typically pay capital gains tax upon death. Um, effectively, if I pass away and leave an asset to someone, they're viewed as having acquired it at the value it was on mm-hmm. the day I died. So um, if my property's increased in value, I'm not expected to pay capital gains mm-hmm. tax on it, um, how much it's appreciated. Just my beneficiary would mm-hmm. acquire it at the, the current value. Yeah. I always thought it's interesting because the there was talk around in the budget around equalising capital gains with income tax and I'm pleased that they didn't do that. Um, and it has increased as ex- expected, but kind of thought it could have been worse. <laughs> it could have been worse. I think, um, you know, to, to have capital gains tax at 20%, 40%, and 45 would have been mm. quite substantial. Um, they've kind of gone for a, you can call it a happy medium, or we can just call it a medium. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it could have certainly been worse. Okay, let's move on to um, inheriting like cash, etc. So I think we've talked about the inheritance tax rules, uh, guys, but actually there's some areas for this that can that can help in terms of, of moving money out of your estate. Let's just talk about some gifting, etc. That, w- that could be useful. Now, Lewis? Yes, I mean, you know, if you, you're trying to mitigate things like inheritance tax and you, you inherit some money, um, you know, a gifting is... is the easiest one alongside spending mm. money. I mean, spending money is probably my favourite one. <laughs> you know, it's um, definitely the easiest one you probably can do, but gifting, absolutely. So if you are making gifts, um, you can get certain allowances for mm. that. So you get an annual exemption of, of £3,000 a year where mm. you gift that and that's straight outside of your estate and you can also backdate that one year. So essentially you, you can do sort of 6000 if you haven't used it before. Um, you can also do... 
gives out a regular income. So if you've got a, it does have to be an income, it can't be out of capital. So if you have regular income and it doesn't impact your standard of living, you can, and, but you've got to consistently do that going forward. That's also straight outside of your estate. Um, and there is all sort of ones, things like marriages mm. or, or wedding presents, basically, and, and small gifts. So there's some of the main ones, but you can do any uh, a big one or, you know, as much as kind of you like, which can be a potentially exempt um, or a, pet, a pet, potentially exempt transfer. Um, and you've just got to survive seven years for that mm. to be out your estate. Um, if you make it past three, then it starts to taper down, basically. Mm. So that, that's most of the rules around sort of gifting. You know, it's interesting we giggle at the um, the fact of spend it, but that is what your money's for. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I think it actually is important that you can you can do these things to to really, you know, ensure that you mitigate against sort of certain types of taxes and your best you have the best planning. But actually, sometimes actually spend mm-hmm. it can be the answer. You know, enjoying your money with your family while you're here. So we kind of we talk we talk about lots of these things. You know, ensuring that you're in the best position. But actually, that's one of sometimes can be the best bit of advice to clients is enjoy your money with your, with your family as well. In some respects, yeah, I think Lewis mentioned gifting and this seven-year rule as well. I think for me, it just drives home the point about thinking ahead and not leaving mm. things too late. If you if you're worried about inheritance tax, you don't want to be leaving it until you're you know 80, 90 years old mm. because often the way that the the rules are set up, it becomes difficult to to make any meaningful impact. So mm. it's always worth having a conversation earlier rather than later. Okay, so we were kind of talking around the point of what you can do prior to inheriting, but actually what happens if you do inherit and what do you do with your money? Because you could end up with actually an inheritance tax problem yourself at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you recommend clients to do? Brand new client, all of a sudden just received some uh, assets from you know from their parents, etc. What would you expect them to do, Hannah? Uh, yeah, so I mean, you can look at your, your tax, tax allowances first of all. Um, so looking at um, ISAs, for example, but it would be good to, to speak with a financial advisor to, again, plan what it is that you need what perhaps you know you might not need uh, depending mm-hmm. on how much you receive and that's when um trusts could potentially come into play um but that with itself can also have um inheritance tax to it uh, ties to it as well with uh lifetime um iht which mm-hmm. is at 20 on certain trusts such as discretionary trusts or interest in possession trusts that are above your nil rate band so again that seven year term comes in any gifts made within that term you just need to be really careful that you're not going to be going over because the sev- it's whatever gifts are made within that seven year term mm-hmm. so again speak with an advisor if you're unsure Okay, let's move into the final section. Uh, Tax implications of inheritance, shares and investments. I think this is one of the areas where we can talk around certain types of products that are still, um, you know, that maybe have come in the estate now than that weren't previously. And But I think uh, just, just to make this really clear, any investment um, from an ISA, GIU or, or pension, soon to be an hour basis, will, could be applied for inheritance tax. Um, let's talk about in other products as well, Lewis, that potentially... Um, clients may have that they can consider yeah so i mean you, it depends on um where exactly it's invested so you know your, your pensions ice and general investment comes the two potential portfolios they're in listed companies so they absolutely will fall under the remit of you know inheritance tax in the sort of normal way but if you invest in unlisted companies um things like aim shares at the moment they still sort of fully they fully fall out of your estate and not subject to in- inheritance tax but from and um, the sixth variable 2026, um, f- basically there'll be like a 50% discount on that inheritance tax. So it'll be an effective work rate of, of 20% that you'd be subject to with, with AIM shares. So yeah, it just depends on exactly the area that it's invested into. I think it's important just to talk about those types of products because um, we would typically categorise those as a higher risk investment. Um, so you, if you're looking at that type of product, you would expect someone to be more of a higher risk profile rather than a sort of standard sort of middle of the road risk profile. Um, okay, let's talk about something that's quite relevant in the news when it comes to inheritance tax. And John, I'm going to pick you on this one. Um, but obviously we're hearing a lot about farmers and farmers land, which was um, you know quite a topical part during the budget and is still being discussed. Um, just talk to me just a little bit about how that affects those types of clients. Yeah, so in, until now, um, farmlands had a, a relief known as al- agricultural relief. Um, where farmers can effectively pass their farmland and so on down to their descendants because often uh, farms are family-run businesses and they don't want to have to sell off a chunk of their land to pay an inheritance tax bill. So to protect those those farming businesses, there was a relief, um, agricultural relief, that meant you didn't pay inheritance tax. Now, um, the budget has brought a, a limit 
into you know the extent that that relief will apply so set at a million pounds the first million pound of farmland can be inherited inheritance tax free um, but beyond that there'll be a, a effectively a 20 percent rate of inheritance tax um, which as you can imagine is a, a huge change for for a lot of farming businesses as i say a lot of the time they're family businesses um they don't want to have to change the the way that their farm is set up and, and sell off assets unnecessarily mm-hmm. so um the the chancellor has come out and said look mm-hmm. if you start to put all of your allowances together it's go- only going to affect the largest farms mm-hmm. so you think about the million pounds standard mm-hmm. inheritance tax bans that a married couple can have we've discussed mm-hmm. those already and then if you think about a married couple they've each got this million pound um farm allowance if you like mm-hmm. the chancellor's talked about how there's effectively a sort of three million pound Mm-hmm. Um, threshold that that could apply, but it, it it remains the case that you know it's it's been received quite poorly, not just from farmers but from the general public as well. Mm-hmm. I think there's this a kind of collective sense of protection that we have over mm-hmm. our farming businesses. Um, so it, it's certainly a controversial one. Yeah, agree. Well, I think we'll leave it there, folks. Um, some some really great uh, sort of thoughts and some observations. Um, I'm going to caveat this I always do, which is if you feel like this potentially could affect you or your portfolios. Um, We would love to speak to you about this. um, And it's really important that you do contact your advisor. I think we are obviously waiting for sort of final guidance on this after consultation. And I think it's quite important that that you do wait for that to come through before making any decision. But if you're feeling like you do need to discuss your advisor, please pick up the phone. We'll be happy to talk to you, whether it's at head office or your financial advisor on the road. So uh, great to see you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. This video is not a recommendation or personal financial advice. With investing, your capital is at risk. Investments can fluctuate in value and you may get back less than you invest.